Uh, it's currently uh, said uh, today I'm bringing my experiences uh, and the scenarios from Nepal. So I'll be talking mainly on the uh, mushrooms, okay? Mushrooms diversity and a kind of ethnomycology in Nepal. So basically my talk is divided in three parts. One is about the status of mushrooms in Nepal. Another, I will be talking about the poisoning, poisoning tragedies and the measures uh, we are taking to control mushroom poisoning in Nepal. And next one will be about the microtourism, which we re recently initiated very first time in Nepal. So, so here uh, you can see a picture uh, where monks, uh, okay, monks from the monastery in very remote areas of Nepal. This is from Gorkha area. So monks, they were collecting mushrooms. And Dr. Devkota, at what age, how young do they take in initiates to be monks? Uh, actually, uh, like normally the boys, they used to be uh, there from early eight or even seven years old. So, yeah. I think there is not a clear and defined age bar to join monk. Their parents, they used to send them to the monastery to go there and to be there and learn or study Buddhism. So, and in most of the cases, those monks, they are not from the same village. If there is a good monastery, then they could join from neighboring neighboring villages and from neighboring districts as well. Yeah. So uh, let me just start. So we are in Nepal now. There's somewhere there is a red dot, Nepal. So may I ask you, like, what are the things that comes to your mind when you think about Nepal, if anyone? I mean, so. And Feel free to unmute yourself to malnutrition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so most of the people think that Mount Everest. Mount Everest is there in Nepal. So Nepal is like Mount Everest country. And many of the people also think that Nepal is a birthplace of Buddha, Lord Buddha. So this is the real you know, identification of Nepal. And here, what we are talking is that we are talking beyond Mount Everest. We are talking beyond Buddha. And maybe you know that Nepal is already a home of like eight highest mountains in the world among the 10 highest mountains. If, if, if you see here, if you can see here, here, like there are two mountains from one from Mount K2 from Pakistan, that is 8,611, and Nanga Parvat from Pakistan, this is 8,126. They are from Pakistan. And rest of the eight mountains, they are from Nepal. So here you see Mount Everest, 8,848, and this Mount Kanchanjunga in the far eastern part of Nepal is like 8,586 meters. So it's like the, we have like eight highest mountains in the world, of course. And apart from the mountains, apart from snow, apart from glaciers, Nepal is also a very rich country in terms of uh, its uh, cultural values and from the biodiversity perspectives. While talking about the cultural value, we have like uh, 26.5 million population. And among those populations, we have like 125 caste. Okay. So it means it is already like multilingual, multilinguistic, multi ethnic, and multicultural country. We have several festivals. We worship almost like <laughs> every creature. We have a special day for snake. We have a special day for dog. We have a special day for dope. 
you know, for line and whatever for tiger. So we celebrate every festival. We enjoy every every biodiversity components. So we have several colors. And talking about the ecosystems, we call Nepal is like we know that Nepal is also called is the Amazon of the Asia. Because we have like in Nepal like 118 different types of ecosystems, 112 forest types, and about 45 percent of the land in Nepal is covered by forest. And let me tell you that Nepal is a landlocked country. Uh, having to join countries like India in eastern, eastern, western, and southern part, and China on the northern part. So it is a landlocked country. Uh, but being a small country, it is really rich in terms of biodiversity, in terms of forest cover. And uh, like 3.3.2% of the world's flora we can find in Nepal and 3.1% of the world's fauna can find in Nepal. Apart from that, Nepal is very rich in terms of butterfly diversity, in terms of birds diversity, and, uh, and uh, higher plants. So here people, they really use plants. They really use non-timber forest products, including mushrooms and lichens. So here you can see one picture. Allium hypsistum, Allium hypsistum. This is endemic plant to Nepal, which we can find in mainly in high altitudes above 4,000 meter. And this plant, we literally use it as a spices. So this is spice. This is mainly used for spices. While making lentils, while making curry, we always and always use these plants. Okay. So we have several types of this kind of unique ecosystems, forest types, and biodiversity. So yes, we are so rich. Uh, and also, like, this is Nepal. And then you can see there, like, these are the uh, national parks. We have national parks here. Uh, we have wildlife reserves, hunting reserves. Uh, conservation areas uh, and buffer zone in every national park. And also uh, like, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is like a brick. Nepal shape is like a brick. So east to waste is like 1000 kilometer. East to waste is like 1000 kilometer. And south to north is like 200 kilometer, okay, in aerial distance. So it means like within a 200, a kilometer narrow boundary we have uh, like we have like a high himalaya like mount everest and sorry yeah and then also uh we have like the plain land tarai we call it tarai the very plain land and the plain land altitude is elevation is like 68 meter so we start from 68 meter and we end it up to mount everest so we can imagine, we can imagine the uh, great uh, sort of, you know, uh, biodiversity species compositions in every elevation gradient. So if you climb up like 200 meter, then you find different sort of biodiversity. This is really interesting. And this makes Nepal so rich in biological resources. So like we have, uh, we have like tiger and elephant or rhinoceros in the lowlands. And in the meantime, we have snow leopard and mox deers in the high mountains. So this makes so much rich in biodiversity. Uh, so though Nepal is so much rich in terms of biodiversity, in terms of higher plants, in terms of mammals and in terms of some plaques and mammals. Sorry. Now, let me to jump into mushrooms. This is what we are talking about. We are going to talk about. So talking about the mushroom diversity, I think not only in Nepal, except in few countries, mushroom diversity is always overdoped. Mushrooms is always overdoped. 
So it is same happening in Nepal. And though the early collections was made like in 1820 by some British, like, uh, British plant taxonomists and collectors, but real orchid mushroom in Nepal has started from last 50 years. Only the real orchid mushroom was studied by Nepalese mycologist and foreign mycologist. So, so far, we have like only 1,291 species. And I'm sure that this is not a great number. This is not a great number. So we made one publication in 2022 and we compiled all the existing literatures. We enumerate all the species. We brought all the available information and ended up with like 1,291 species and 159 individual species from Nepal. So this is the latest publications and scenarios from Nepal. Uh, so this is the picture which I retrieved from Global Biodiversity Information Facility Portal. This is the online portal, freely assessed portal. And if you look there, uh, we can clearly see that those, black, uh, those yellow dots and red dots, they are quite lacking from Africa, from Latin America, northern part of Asia, or northern, yeah, northern part of Latin America and Africa and in Asian countries. This is seriously lacking. And so there are, there are so many occurrences records from Europe, from America, from Australia, eastern part of Australia, and South Africa, and southern part of Latin America. So it clearly shows that such parts are less represented, you know? So mushrooms or fungi, they are less represented from the global south. So what I have found, like in Nepal, we have very poorly you know, uh, studied. Mushroom is very poorly studied. And what my perception is that this is a gap, okay? This is a great gap. This is a big gap. And I'm trying to see this gap as an opportunity to work. So whatever we are doing in Nepal, so everything will be a kind of new initiative, new initiation. So we started a kind of digitization project and that is a new one. And we started uh, microtourism, this is a new concept. So this gap, we have a gap and we have opportunity. That is what I believe. Okay. Uh -huh. So, so more, let's zoom into Nepal. So this is Nepal. Uh, so, so far from Nepal, only 5,563 occurrences have been listed on the GBIF portal. And you see the red dots, they are from everywhere, but they are seriously lacking in several places of Nepal. Like, uh, okay, here is Kathmandu. This is the capital city of Nepal. Okay, this is the capital city. Kathmandu is also called the city of temples. There are like more than 5,000 temples. In early days, it was saying that the people in Kathmandu and the number of temples in Kathmandu, they are both same, I mean, in equal in number. So this is a city of temples. Uh, and I'm here in Pokhara. So this is my city, okay? This is my city. I'm living just 200 uh, kilometer west of uh, Kathmandu. And if we look clearly, these red dots, they are more or less, you know, big size in big circles uh, in and around Kathmandu. So it means most of the collections that, that, that came from around the Kathmandu, there is very nice forest in Kathmandu. Around the vicinity, there are so many water sites and the heat medials areas. So most of the studies were focused in and around Kathmandu, looking after the easy way. And also there are some things from Nepal, uh, from, from Pokhara, from my city. Actually, my city is like, this is very beautiful city. This is very touristic city. <laughs> it was so nice that Lily was here, you know, working on mushrooms. Uh, in Pokhara, she was here. And then this is like, uh, this is also, uh, my city is also 
is a lake of a city of seven lakes. We have similar kind of seven lakes, and this is Pewa Lake, where you can see the clear reflection of uh, Mount uh, uh, Mount Annapurna Himalayan Range. This is actually the Annapurna Himalayan Range, and here you see this is a Fiskel Mountain. Um, let me zoom in more. Okay. So this is Mount Fiskel because it looks like Fis, uh, Fis, Fiskel. And if you, if you move around, then, I mean, uh, you can see several uh, faces of this uh, mountain. So what I'm telling is that still, there are so many areas to explore in Nepal. Uh, and if we look, because uh, if we look in the, assessment reports either made by the uh, local level or in the regional level or even in the global level uh, most of the reports uh, though nepal is sort of you know sort of rich country in terms of biodiversity uh, many in many cases mushrooms they are underrepresented and are undervalued uh, either whether in research or in conservation planning uh, or global and regional assessment and decision-making processes. So this is the report. This is the recent report made by, uh, made on the Hindu Kush Himalayan assessment. Actually, Nepal is also part of Hindu Kush Himalaya. And where they were talking mainly on caterpillar fungus, but not about other fungus and other lichens. So, okay. So as I said, Gap is always an opportunity. So what we did is that we try to bring uh, we try to bring uh, our uh, museum specimens, whatever or in whatever in conditions or whatever in number, uh, deposited in national herbarium uh, in Kathmandu and in in different places of Tribune University. And Nature History Museum, one and only museum in Nepal, Nature Museum, Nature History Museum in Nepal, that is Nature History Museum under Tribune University. So what we did is in, in one year that we we looked, we literally look on each and every envelope, each and every collections, and we try to identify all the unidentified specimens. And we, we made a kind of, uh, we curated uh, specimens and we digitized all these specimens. And we came up with uh, like lichens, 2,462 uh, envelopes and mushrooms with 3,971 uh, envelopes. So these are the specimens number. It means now we have a kind of, data okay we have a kind of data now we have a kind of idea that how many specimens we have so far and we ended up with these six data sets now we can have now these data sets are assessed through the gb global online portal and freely assessed from the gb so anyone interested in nepalese micro mycology anyone interested in nepalese fungi and lichens now they can have a look you know, they can have a look on the scenarios, they can have a look on their details and the pictures, whatever available. So if you are interested to know more about the you know, taxonomy of lichens and mushrooms in Nepal, you can easily get assist. Uh, and uh, so we have mushrooms for flora of Nepal, Nature Museum, lichens from the Garbariums, lichens from the university, mushrooms from the university. So we have all the data now available. So uh, apart from digitizations, as um, mm, uh, I said that, um, I want to share this very good news that actually I was working as a selected fellow member for this IPBS assessment. Actually, this IPBS is an intergovernmental panel with more like 140 countries are members of this assessment uh, of this IPBS. Like, um, like it is like the same UN entities for like for climate change we have IPCC and for biodiversity we have IPBS. Okay, so 
I was like a selected fellow of a member for last 20, 2018 to 2021. Uh, and I worked there with uh, 85 leading experts from the world around the world, and also with social scientists. And it is like an interdisciplinary research, uh, interdisciplinary work. And there, it was so amazing for me that uh, I could bring, you know, I could literally write about mushrooms. I could literally write about lichens uh, from the Himalayas, not only from the Himalayas, from, but around the world to bring something Okay, to bring something in the report. This is great. This is great. Now, and uh, in last uh, in in this July, uh, there was a plenary uh, in Bonn, Germany, and uh, they approved the report. They approved the report, and luckily, uh, they selected my picture, uh, a man, a Sherpa guy, uh, holding a vegetable sulfurous uh, image from Nepal. So. Actually, this is a very good, uh, this is really nice to see that, um, you know, mushrooms, uh, mushroom dust popped up on the report, on the front cover, and they selected this picture among the hundreds. So this is really good. Uh, here, I would like to uh, bring some key statistics and facts from this report is that uh, here in this report, uh, what we have found that 50,000 plus wild species being used for food, energy, medicine, materials, and other purposes. And among those, uh, among those, these number, like 34% of the species are uh, sustainably used, okay? Uh, and like we have data for fish, we have data for invertebrates, and then uh, like 1,500 species of fungi, okay? So, the 1500 species of fungi are directly used by people all over the world. So we got such reports. So this is interesting to know that 10,000 wild species harvested for human food and 70% of the world's poor community, they directly dependent on wild species and on business, okay, fostered by them. So, now they, they brought like summary for policymaker and sooner they will be bringing out the final report and which will be available from IBBS website. So this is a kind of development on fungi and mushrooms. Uh, it's, uh, uh, yes, please. If you go back to that picture, could you talk about the, the um, chicken mushroom in that photograph? Oh, sure, thank you. Uh, so actually, uh, this picture, I took this picture in 2011 uh, in far eastern part of Nepal, that is Kanchanjunga region. Kanchanjunga is the far eastern, uh, far eastern part of Nepal, adjoining to India. And he's a Sherpa guy. He collected these mushrooms, literally. He collected these mushrooms. And he was asking uh, whether to serve us this mushroom, then we enjoyed I mean, we cooked these mushrooms together. We enjoyed this mushroom together. And this is one of the very best mushrooms that people normally use, mostly living in the middles area of Nepal. Middles means this mushroom is available from 1500, 1500 meter to up to 3,500 meter around. Um, we call it a rata chow. Rata means red, red, the color is red, and chow means mushrooms, red mushrooms. Rato Chiao in Nepal. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, we were talking like um, uh, caterpillar of hungers and Lily is here. She will be here in Nepal sooner and going to this site. This is from Dolpa. This area is from Dolpa, Lily. So uh, we need to walk like four days to reach this pasture to reach this collection site from the district headquarters. So from my early, uh, earlier studies, while I was working for WW of Nepal, uh, for, uh, on Caterpillar of WW of Nepal, then I got an opportunity to be there for like two years, two consecutive years, and uh, to make a, a ecological and socio-economical uh, socio survey and I said uh, there, I established several permanent plots 
to work on this caterpillar fungus. And actually this caterpillar fungus, uh, like I, I think, the, uh, just me, sorry. So this is Dolpo. This is Dolpo region of Nepal. So there is very nice like Pokshundo. This is Lake Pokshundo, like, and these are settlements there. People used to live there like in even like in 4,000 meter altitudes. And there are some monuments. And what I'm talking is that uh, caterpillar fungus. Uh, caterpillar fungus is uh, like uh, the distribution of caterpillar fungus is very limited. Uh, this is a picture, uh, this is an image uh, from Daniel Winkler. Uh, he made this nice um, uh, figure. And we can see uh, caterpillar fungus in northwestern part of India, that is Uttaranchal. And along the, uh, along the mountain belt of Nepal, east west, and a part of Bhutan, and, and major part of China and Tibet. So this is very endemic to Nepal. And having these very limited uh, distributions and uh, high price, okay? So this is also called the Himalayan gold in Nepal. And if we look the story uh, behind the collection of this caterpillar fungus, this is really very uh, difficult task to get that fungus. So, you see, there are collectors on the way to passes. They were on the fourth day of their trip and have to work still more three or four, two, three or four days, depending on where they move. Okay. So there are like 25 different passes in Dolpa where people used to visit to collect caterpillar fungus. And they were working like seven days, literally, to reach to these passes. And it, it, it is not easy. I mean, the walking is not easy. They need to carry uh, foods. Uh, they need to carry their tents or tampolins, and they need to carry their tools to dig uh, caterpillar fungus. They need to carry everything, okay? They need to carry their home with them because they need to survive like for one to two months in, in those highland passes above 4,000 meters. So this is really, really very tricky and difficult thing to uh, call a caterpillar fungus in Nepal. Uh, like this is, I really like this picture. I took this picture in Dolpo in 2007, uh, but it's still the situation is same there. You see the thousands of people, you see thousands of people, they were simply moving, okay? They were simply moving on the passes. Uh, and they will find a place to set their camp, set their camp, okay? And even children, old age people, old age people, and people from every professions, they used to, they used to go there uh, to collect, uh, to hunt for this caterpillar fungus, because that's a big money. That's a big money. I mean, uh, you see, you see the crowd. So, we have like 25 different pastures or you know, uh, flat lanes in Dolpa uh, where people make their uh, temporary settlements <clears throat> and they, sorry, they hunt their, uh, they hunt caterpillar fungus. Now I'm not talking uh, in broad, I'm not talking about their ecology, I'm not talking about uh, their environmental effects, which we can, I mean, clearly see or clearly visualize. You can already imagine the trampling effects made by 40,000 plus collectors. You can already imagine uh, the pollutions created by 40,000 plus people, either soil pollutions or, uh, or water pollutions, and they normally live nearby the tree line that is 3,500 to 4,000 meters. And they cut, I mean, they cut uh, junipers and the tree line plants uh, as a pew load. So, Okay, so I mean, ecological, from ecological point of view, this is very devastating. This is very devastating. But if we look from the monetary value, if we look through the, their livelihood option, caterpillar fungus is a really good option because they could survive from six to eight months with this fungus money. Now the problem is, not the problem, but the situation is that 
uh, how to tackle this kind of ecological erosions without losing their rights to the natural resources. This is really a tricky thing. And there are several provisions in China, there are their own provisions in Bhutan, they have their own provision in India, and they have own provision in Nepal. So, but, but still in Nepal, this is a really a challenging task to control the crowds and to minimize the trampling effects in those kind of fragile mountain landscape. After all, this is a big money. Catapongas is a big money big and big money so in the market uh, let me to tell uh, let me to uh, share that the collection the, the season for the collection is june july and august but literally june and july the best season to collect caterpillar fungus and this is a very lucrative and sacred market i mean market channel is very sacred uh, like in nepal the price for a kg of dried caterpillar fungus is like 15,000 US dollar. So it's a big money. And the main countries to trade centers are Tibet, Singapore, Korea, Japan, and European countries. And main traders are Tibetan and Nepalese. And you can, you can see a trader on horseback. So this is a big money. And when there is big money, there is always a gambling, you know, there is a crime. So this is very normal, this is very normal. So just to avoid the robbery and just to avoid other things. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, uh, the traders, they even, uh, you know, they, the traders, they even uh, charter, they charter helicopters, okay, uh, to, to transfer uh, caterpillar fungus from pastures from district headquarters to Kathmandu uh, safely. So this is a very big trade. And let me let me tell you that uh, Nepal was like uh, in a Maoist revolution period from in 1998 to until 2007 or 8. And during the Maoist revolution period, uh, this caterpillar fungus money was supposed to be a great you know, source of income for them. Uh, to make their revolutions. We can, we can read such stories in several books. So after the Maoist, uh, when the, after the Maoist, they came to the government mainstream and then the resources uh, that, uh, then after the resources goes to the local people, a local management committee, and they have their own management committee to take care of this caterpillar fungus in Nepal. So this is all about the caterpillar fungus. Uh, so I, I thought that you like this. And apart from caterpillar fungus, apart from that big mushroom money, there is, uh, I want to show you some pictures of mushrooms. They are literally being you know, highly used um, in Nepal. Like we have termitomyces clapiatus. This mushroom is so much abundant that we can find this from east to west, okay, east to west and up to 3,500 meters from the low land. So uh, this is highly praised and highly edible mushrooms from Nepal. And apart from that, this agaricus biosporus, mainly the people living in the higher altitude, they collect these mushrooms, agaricus biosporus, like a nomadic men or like the people uh, we used to uh, run after uh, their seeps, you know, on cattle in the mountains, they collect this agaricus biosporus. And this is Lytiporus alpurius. This is also very common, mushrooms in Nepal. And you can see uh, this picture was taken by my friend Kamal. And then this was from the Everest area since long back, since long back. And there the porters, you know, the porters, they collected these mushrooms while they're, uh, while they're, they were moving upward with the loads on their back and they prepared their own food on the way and they collected this uh, latiporous alpurias. They cooked half of the fung uh, half of the mushrooms and still we can see half uh, remains here. So you can imagine the size. So this is also very popular. And another is Gumpus clavitus. This is uh, 
this mushroom is available in the middle part of Nepal. And the people, they normally collect in a large amount uh, and even make dry for, for the uh, winter. Uh, and few more thing is that uh, here I'm saying Rosula complex because we have so many Rosula species, edible species in Nepal. Uh, and he's a guy from Tamang community. So Tamang community is like, uh, uh, Tamang, Tamang uh, community is very indigenous community of Nepal. Uh, normally they live in the middle part of Nepal. And they have a kind of belief that they can eat every mushroom, okay? They can eat every mushrooms. And you see that, uh, I think that was Rosula sinensis. And they collect every mushrooms and whatever they found, they used to go to nearby market, nearby market and sell that collection. So this is very common. And what, why I'm showing this Scalodorma species is that they think that, I mean, they literally think that this Scalodorma is edible species. Not in uh, this kind of this uh, mature one, but while they are very young, uh, without forming their spores in black seeds, in a in a very young stage, they they collected uh, they collect this scleroderma and cooked is the same way we cook uh, potato, same like a potato. Okay, so this is interesting only among those uh, indigenous communities and of course this griffula frondosa so this is everyone's uh, twice and easily available in in, in work forest uh, from 1600 or 1700 meter altitudes so we have another ramaria complex and uh, and uh, some helvella crispa or pseudocratibus undulatus so here monk is collecting. So ramari is also very common mushrooms, mainly in mountainous part of Nepal, and they collect it and they make it dry. So talking about that, this is the very, very typical way to eat trimetomyces, okay, clapiatus. They collect it, they clean, and then they prepare it because we eat uh, lots of rice. <laughs> we eat rice in the morning as a lunch and rice in the evening as a dinner. So uh, this is the way how we cook uh, this tomatoized clapiatus, uh, and we eat together with rice, lentils, some spinach, uh, and some vegetables. So this is the way how we eat uh, this tomatoized. So these are the things. These are really good things that we have so many mushroom resources to eat from the forest. But unfortunately, what is happening is that. This is not. This is not always the case. We have so many uh, mushroom poisoning um, events every every year and repeating, you know, in a repeating way. So uh, you can see that, like, five members of a family die after consuming poisonous mushrooms. One died seven fell. Wild mushrooms kill fourteen in Nepal. Poisonous wild mushrooms kill two in Elam, six die after consuming wild mushrooms in Nepal. This is really, really very tragic, uh, very tragic. So now we are trying to compile all the poisoning cases since last 20 years. So still we are working on that. So I don't have very rigorous data to show you. Maybe we'll have such data after one and two months and we'll publish that paper in a good journal. And that will give a kind of idea that how many people were and with community and with social backgrounds and what are the variables. So here, one thing is clear, like while mushrooms kill 14 in Nepal, it means mushrooms always here in Nepal, mushroom, people think that mushroom is like a gift item, okay, gift item. They, they used to go to the forest, collect mushrooms, and they steer their collection to their neighbors. And their neighbors 100% believe on that on them. And the mass poisoning occurs. This is how mass poisoning occurs. Another thing is uh, how mass poisoning is being occurred in Nepal is that uh, you can see it in this picture. So children, okay. 
children's uh, children they literally collect mushrooms while coming from the school back to home and while in the pastures to collect other non timber forest products they collect mushrooms and they also even collect mushrooms from nearby their home and you see this picture and this picture is here this black you know this is like a lens this zigzag line is a trail trail so they are in remote area they are in remote area it means in most of the time uh, the poisoning cases they are not appear in national media they are not appear in television or any newspaper any fm stations or radio so and being in a remote area they do not have proper healthcare systems and they they uh, they, they are losing their life okay so children uh, and and the children went back from school they used to collect mushrooms they used to prepare food for their parents even they used to prepare food for their parents and because of their very weak physiology and they got uh, poisoned and most of in most of the cases children are the victims okay children are victims Mm. Uh, so we can see, I mean, like, this is the very recent one. So this is a tragic, uh, seven years old boy hospitalized and three members of the same family, uh, they lost their life. So, so cases are repeating every year. So 15 fell ill after consuming poisonous muscle in Bhutal and then a very weak uh, infrastructure, health facilities, they are losing their life. So what we are doing, okay? So now we know that, we know that people are just simply dying. So what could we do from our level, okay? What could we do from my personal level? And what could we do from our group member, uh, our group level, from local level? So my concern is that because I'm working on this, among fungus uh, on mushrooms since last 2003. But actually that was for my master's degree, that was for my PhD degree. And when I came back from Switzerland, after spending my uh, PhD days there, uh, I decided to work completely. Um, I decided to bring my science to the society. And I believe that our science uh, should, uh, should reach to the society so I started uh, meeting people. Normally I started meeting survivors, okay? Those all are survivors. So I started meeting survivors and I asked them, okay, so can you show me which kind of mushrooms you eat? And used to work with them in the forest. And whenever we found mushrooms then we collected that and used to show that to the local people and tell them not to eat. I, I have found this is very effective way to communicate science to the society. So in this picture in the lower left, uh, we were in Palpa, that is like 90 kilometers far from my city. We were working in Annapurna Range and we heard that there was poisoning effects and two well people were died and 40 were hospitalized. And then the next day we went there. And then we went uh, to the forest with survivors and we found that there is Amanita species, Amanita longistrata, I guess, yes. Yeah. It was there, it was growing there. And we tell people, we tell local people, we tell police, we tell health personals, please, please make aware about these mushrooms. Let not people to collect and eat these mushrooms. So these are also very indigenous community, Chepan community. And here I was there because in every time, whenever I reached there, we could not find poisonous mushrooms, okay? in all the time. So I decided to make a kind of photo diary with all the poisonous mushrooms so that I could show that diary to people and they will tell that, okay, this is poisonous one, we eat these mushrooms. So whenever we, don't have, we do not have any living mushrooms, then I used to show photographs and I used to talk with them and listen their stories and make them aware. So what I have found is that uh, like, uh, uh, Amanita Shutrina, 
uh, Amanita longstrata, Amanita pantoriana, Amanita phalloides, Amanita fol folginia, and Calobolito spaniformis. So these are a kind of typical poisonous mushroom in Nepal. Okay. Uh, so all Amanita and only Calobolitus, and I have found that the calopene compound is responsible for the poisoning effect, if I'm correct. So most, in most of the cases, of course, Amanita, they are poisonous mushrooms in Nepal. So this is a really very interesting slide uh, to share with you all. And I normally use these pictures to make people aware. Because we have one mushroom. This is Amanita chepangiana. Amanita chepangiana. Chepang actually, it was an uh, endemic mushroom to Nepal. And this chepangiana is from the chepang community. Okay, Chepangiana is named, uh, this mushroom is named after this chepang indigenous community, Amanita chepangiana. This is from the lowland of Nepal, Chiton National Park. And there are other mushrooms. And actually, this Amanita chepangiana is edible stuff. Okay, this is edible stuff. And we have like Amanita virosa and Amanita citrina in, in the same forest or in other parts of Nepal. But this Amanita chepangiana is from the eastern part of Nepal or central part of Nepal. So, whenever the people from mainly the workers, road workers, okay, uh, they move from Eastern part to the Western part, they always got confused with this mushroom, Chepangiana, and they think Amanita citrina and Amanita virosa is Amanita Chepangiana, and they got poisoned. So untrained eyes, I would say, untrained eyes and their identification practices that made people suffer, that made people really suffer. So what we are trying to do is let people know that, okay, this is not Chepangiana, this is Virosa, this is Citrina. Look, this is literally different, okay? So with their morphology and with their morphology. So we are trying to give this message to the people. And we also brought some posters, uh, some sensitized, uh, some awareness materials, uh, it was from 2020 postures, and here, uh, this is the recent one with all the poisonous mushrooms, and we bring these mushrooms in Nepali because in most of the cases uh, to the children and in the remote areas, so we decided to go to Nepali language. And, uh, and yes, I would also like to thank uh, this mushroom club of Georgia because, and thanks to Lily because she made uh, a kind of connection with this club and I got a kind of support from this club as well. That's why I've included this mushroom club of Georgia logo on the posters with kind consent from Cornelia and Sam. Thank, thanks for that. So what we are doing is we are simply distributing posters. I mean, we cannot do anything then. So we are, distribu we are distributing posters. We are also bringing um, bags, school bags, you know, with a, with a very clear awareness note that not to eat any unknown mushrooms. And uh, some posters, some leaflets to distribute. And whenever I go, the only thing I could tell to the people is that amatoxins or other kind of toxins cannot be detoxified, even if boiled and cooked, because we have so many misconceptions in Nepal. People think that, okay, boiling could, uh, you know, remove toxins or cooking could remove toxins or, this, uh, or whatever, you know, but and vinegars and other, other stuff. So that really doesn't work. So I'm always, you know, giving pressure to the people to listen that hematoxins cannot be detoxified even if boiled and cooked. So this is a great message to people. So what we are doing is that we are trying to reach to the different community, okay? Different community, different age groups, different professions, uh, children, old men, monks, women, uh, poor people, and tell them that what to eat and what to not eat. 
Okay, so it is always easy to say that please do not eat any unknown mushrooms, then to eat these mushrooms, which I normally do not recommend to eat. I mean, if they are 100% sure to eat, they can eat, okay? Otherwise, I will tell that simply avoid any unknown mushrooms. And this is really working very well since last couple of years. And whenever I visit, I mean, I have traveled in several parts of Nepal, okay? I have traveled several parts of Nepal and whenever I visit people and they, I have seen that they are so much interested in mushrooms and in, in several places they used to collect for the winter season. This is from, this is from Annapura mountain trekking route from Banang. And this is also from, I think this is from Everest region. So yeah, I'm sure in whatever, you know. So this is from very remote area from Dolpa and to the local uh, local community members or what's the leaders so that they could communicate that to their people. And even talking with the, with the people uh, taking care of cattle, okay, so, so that they could not collect any poisonous mushrooms and looking after their collections, what they have collected. And here a guy, he was showing me some Suilas, Suilas species. I think this is in, uh, yeah, Suilas species asking whether to eat it or not. So this is the gradation. And at the end, children, okay, children, always the first priority. Children, always the first priority because they are collectors. They are collectors. They used to get this kind of plastics or even some baskets and they, they go to the forest and collect whatever they could find, whatever they decide that this is edible. Actually, these all are edible mushrooms. This is, uh, uh, this is a Lactarius thakalorum. Lactarius thakalorum. Thakalorum, this is endemic mushrooms. And thakalorum is from the indigenous uh, thakali community, okay? So this is Lactarius species and this is the edible stuff. And, but this is not a case of always. Uh, so we try to, we always try to uh, reach this kind of young children. Okay, you were just like six, six or seven years old. So we try to reach to the young young children and school, schools, okay? And school children and teachers and community members and mothers group. So we are trying to reach to such communities uh, from our own way. So, uh, but the the impact I will say impact uh, of our advocacy impact of our advocacy our work uh, our publications uh, might have supported to the government and since this year the government is bringing posters okay bringing poster on mushrooms this is very new development and this is in Nepal, in Nepali, and they were asking, while well, mushrooms might be poisonous, not to touch and eat, and we cannot uh, cook uh, poisonous mushrooms, we cannot eat poisonous mushrooms even after cooking, so better not to eat any unknown mushrooms. So this is a great poster, poster you know, um, brought by the government. And uh, what we have found is that, um, to, to minimize this kind of poisoning stops in Nepal, uh, all health organizations could be interested and UNICEF Nepal could be interested or UNICEF could be interested because this is a poisoning issue. This is a children's issue. Uh, so there, there could be possible contributors for our next year uh, poisoning mission. That's it. So uh, why we are doing this is, what we are doing is that uh, if you save one life, you save a world entire. So this is Oscar Snyder. This is what uh, inspiring me to work on this um, poisoning effect. So let me to switch to another part. Uh, this is the last part of my presentations. Uh, here I'll be talking uh, uh, about the microtourism prospects. So um, let me to remind you that in the beginning, uh, I said that Nepal, in Nepal, we are starting everything from the scratch, okay? Everything from the scratch. 
Now we made a kind of enumeration in 2020 and we, we ended up with 1290 species. So now we have something to tell that, okay, we have this kind of species, we have these species. We started digitization projects and now we can tell that, okay, we have so, so many specimens lost in national herbariums or naturist museums. Now we have a data, whatever we have, okay? And as, as I got my PhD from Switzerland, I was always fascinated uh, looking after the work on mushrooms in Switzerland. They have very nice uh, web portal to document every species. And in Spain or in France or in Germany, like this kind of microtourism, truffle hunting, mushroom hunting, I was witness on that. So I was inspired to start similar thing in Nepal. And I got like-minded um, friend, colleague, uh, Ricard Silver. I, actually, he's a member of Mushroom Club of Washington, DC. And he got that idea, brilliant idea. And then we came together and we started to, we, we decided to start as a trial, uh, micro tourism expedition in Nepal. So, and it was a great success. I mean, it was a great success. So June 15 to July 2, like in 18 days, we were in Everest area, in the Everest area. And actually it was a very first, uh, experience for us to organize this kind of uh, micro tourism prospects and it was a super super exciting project so we got we got like nine clients okay we got like nine clients from usa and from mexico and they are really good clients and uh, from different backgrounds as a sociology professor or attorney you know uh, our medical doctor. So they were from different uh, background. And we started our trip uh, from the capital city Kathmandu. And actually there, there are regular flights from Kathmandu to uh, uh, Everest in the Solukhambu, but uh, because of the season and the flights are not regular, uh, we decided to take, uh, take you know, jeeps and we travel. It was really fun. Uh, it was really fun. We, we traveled by a zip for two days, one and a half days, and we started walking uh, along the trail. Uh, so we have a class. And one, one good thing is that uh, actually this June, July, August, and September, this is, this is a monsoon period in Nepal. So this is a rainfall period uh, time in Nepal. And um, so most of the hotels in the Everest area, they were empty, okay, no guests. But we were there. I mean, we were giving a kind of business to local people. They were so happy. So this is a kind of off-season tourism. So making this kind of micro-tourism in Nepal, and not only promote uh, mushrooms, but it also promotes uh, or support the local people uh, during the off-season period, okay? So we started, uh, we started from the very low lanes from this forested area and we ended uh, up to uh, Everest to get base camp 5,000 plus meter altitude. So we were just looking mushrooms along the trail, okay? We were just looking mushrooms along the trail. We were not going deep in the, into the forest. So while walking, we can see several mushrooms on the trail. So this is already Cantrulus minor and then we can see similar several mushrooms on the trail and we took pictures and whatever. Uh, so it was really exciting projects because we ended up with 155 species. This is really huge. So we ended uh, only along the trail, okay? Without going deep into the forest. So we ended with 155 species and we found several new species to Nepal and might be some new to science uh, after their work after work on that. So what we have found is that from 2200 to up to 32, 3300, there was a higher diversity of uh, mushrooms in the Everest area. So uh, this is interesting. And let me share some of the interesting mushrooms pictures uh, like, so uh, 
you see, uh, this is Emani Tetulosian, eh? and this uh, this mushroom was uh, report uh, was reported only one time uh, from India in 2019. So this is also first record to Nepal, and then another Trimela salmonia. Uh, it was reported uh, from China in 2019, and this is also a very new record. And let me to show you that uh, in our group, in our um, in our microtourism group. Um, uh, Britt Bonnier, uh, Dr. Britt Bonnier, editor in chief of Fungi Magazine. Uh, he was with us. It was so nice. Uh, we learned so many things from him, and he was so much interested. You know, so this Emanita and other species is actually very knowledgeable on Emanita group, and also on other mushrooms. So it was nice to have him. And we have also we had also like Thomas Royal. He, he is a PhD student. Uh, from the Clack University, and uh, he was uh, working under the supervision of Tom Hawk, and he also really speaks knowledge. So uh, it was good to be surrounded with mycologists, uh, with citizen scientists, uh, and it was great fun. And we ended up with this kind of very interesting uh, mushrooms. So this is another interesting mushrooms, Emanita inata fibriola. Uh, we record it uh, very first time from our tree, and here I am. Okay, so uh, why I'm showing this picture is that uh, you see this is uh, already a Kumbu glacier. Kumbu means Everest glacier. This is Everest glacier. Mount Everest is somewhere here. This is the Mount Everest region, and this is glacier. And we were like in 5,100 meter altitudes. And there we spotted this uh, lycopodon like mushrooms. This here is the mushrooms. Uh, here is the mushrooms. And we suppose that this is the highest record of mushrooms <laughs> from around the world, okay? Because we were already in 5,100 meters. So I will do further work on this uh, mushroom and then uh, probably we'll, we will come uh, with a new name. Uh, for this lycopodon like, like mushroom. So this is really fascinating part of this trip. And something more is like Lactarius uh, Hasudaki. Uh, this is also uh, very good mushrooms. And this Intonema liquorescence, I never saw that mushrooms before this trip. So this is very new to me. Intonema and uh, liquorescence, actually Thomas Royal, he spotted this mushroom. And this is Gupiana halvolwise. I am showing only very interesting mushrooms, okay? So this is Gupiana halvolwise uh, from the Everest. Uh, and this one, okay? This one is like Lexinium orantiacum, uh, very giant mushrooms. It was like half an kg and weight. And we prepared that mushrooms and we cooked together. So normally during the foray, uh, we used to cook, uh, we used to cook mushroom, okay? Uh, we we used to eat together with local people. In one event, uh, we tried to collect uh, this uh, Shulis Sibiricus, Sibiricus mushroom. And then uh, there are people in, in, in Sagarmatha area, in Everest region, they think that Shulis Sibiricus is not edible in stuff. But I was collecting that mushrooms. We were collecting that mushrooms. Uh, and the local people, local women was telling me that, oh, do not eat this mushroom. This is poisonous one. You are going to kill your uh, clients, okay? But uh, we, uh, we got that. And then uh, at the end, uh, in the evening, we prepare a uh, very nice, uh, very delicious pizza, okay? Using that mushroom. So we used to eat mushrooms uh, during our trip. So this is what we, we did with Lexinium oranticum. And here are a few more snaps uh, from mushroom soup. We, actually, this was prepared by a local people, a local hotelier, and we prepared this with uh, Shulas Sibiricus. And this is, uh, again, Lexinium oranticum dried one. And our clients is big silver, and uh, we also interacted with the local people uh, along the way where about their uh, concept or about ethnomycology and other prospects. It was great. So it was great to see that how uh, people were drying mushrooms, you know, uh, drying mushrooms for winter seasons and how they were collecting. And even there was a kind of mushroom palm in lowlands of Everest area because 
uh, this woman, uh, she afraid in eating wild mushrooms and she started cultivating herself because she cannot, you know, she's so fond of mushrooms and there is a pleuritus, osteosis mushrooms she cultivated. And it was a fun part that we see mushrooms and so our plants, they not only, you know, uh, I mean, they were so, so much, uh, they were so pleased in seeing mushrooms everywhere. So this is a typical, this is a kind of typical rural village in the Everest area. Uh, so these are the Sherpa people are living here and they used to collect mushrooms and some pictures from our trip, uh, how they enjoy mountains, uh, how they cherish the moment and how they enjoy the local livelihood with the eggs and other things. And we ended up our 18 days trip. Okay, we ended up our trip is in a very exciting way with so many mushrooms, with so uh, much exciting experiences. And it was a great fun. And it was a great start, I would say, because we not only uh, uh, supported to the local economy, we, do, we only not supported to the local tourism, we not only supported to the mushrooms. Um, history or mushrooms culture, but we started something new, okay? This is the very first and foremost mycological expedition in Nepal, and we will replicate. And then after, after completing our, this trip, we organized a uh, press meet, okay? We organized press meet because uh, we need to let people know that uh, mushroom is also a good, uh, you know, option in the off-season tourism. So we started, uh, we, we, we met, uh, we did on press meet and uh, uh, it was nice that uh, our trip was covered in the major media houses by, ma by major media houses, like every season is calm during monsoon, but monsoon can be new draw for trackers, okay? So we started something new and it was covered so widely that uh, several newspapers, uh, televisions, um, they broadcasted our work. And yeah, really good to see all of these. And we are planning similar thing in next uh, 2023 in Mata and in Annapurna region. This is a picture from Annapurna region. So oh, what's this, okay. Here I can, maybe sound is not working, but I just want to, so this is just a one minute video clip. So it's the bread burn air is there and our plants is there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this, I'd like to thank all my supporting hands, uh, organizations, including Muslim Club of Georgia, and all of you for your gracious presence. Thank you very much.